Yes, uh, to everybody I know, uh, hello again. And uh, to everybody I haven't met, uh, let's talk sometime. My name is Steve Grubb. I'm a security architect at Red Hat. And I work on uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, primarily um, looking at security for certifications, uh, such as Common Criteria, FIPS, uh, SCAP, uh, and other things we do. So this talk is, is going to be about application whitelisting. And uh, we're going to dig into some interesting topics uh, along the way. So um, this is the, the outline of what we're going to be talking about. Oh, OK. OK. So what we're going to talk about here is, uh, you know, what is application whitelisting? Uh, compare it to other solutions, uh, how code executes. Uh, we're going to talk about the design of a solution, uh, talk about sources of trust, and how this might fit into an overall uh, system design. So a, a couple years ago, uh, NIST uh, released a, a special publication, 800-167. Uh, and it's useful uh, because it defines a few terms and talks about uh, different things that application whitelisting should take into account. And so the way that they define uh, whitelist is it's the list of uh, applications, libraries, or files that's authorized to be present or active based on a well-defined baseline. A blacklist is a list of discrete entities uh, previously determined to be associated with malicious activity. So permitted activity is, corresponds to a whitelist, and not permitted activity corresponds to a blacklist. Also, uh, common criteria has an optional requirement. Uh, that's the software restriction policies, uh, where you may um, elect one of several ways to restrict the execution of software. Uh, some, some people use uh, digital signatures. Um, you, you can also use hash, or you can use file paths. Antivirus is a blacklisting approach. Uh, you know, it defines you know, the malware, but the, you know, the problem with it is there's much more out there that, that we don't know about. So, uh, you know, mandatory access control uh, usually restricts based on behavior and subject-object rules around information flow and access. Provenance of software is really not taken into account. Application whitelisting is, is a different approach where you tell it, uh, this is the things we know about, which is simpler to say because usually you know what's installed on a system. So if you take a look at the uh, Lockheed Martin kill chain and, or the, uh, the MITRE attack uh, system, uh, you know, which describes you know, the, the way that uh, intrusions happen and what they try to do, uh, the place where application whitelisting sits is right between compromise and execution. And that's, that's the area that we're, that we're able to target. Um, coincidentally, should they get past execution, then you know, we'd be targeting everything on the right-hand side also. OK, um, so one of the things we need to think about is you know, how, how programs uh, execute. Um, usually, they start you know, with an exec VE, you know, which calls uh, the kernel, and it opens a file, loads it, passes it to the runtime linker, it resolves the libraries, and then you know, it uh, jumps to main and takes off. But there's also another trick, and that is you can execute uh, ELF files directly from the runtime linker. And so like if you have something that's mounted uh, read-only, or, or no, with uh, the no execute, um, this is a trick that people have used in the past where you can just download, download it as a read-only file, and then you can use the runtime linker to execute it, because runtime linker just reads the file. It doesn't try to execute it, but you know, later it does but it doesn't do it through an exec VE. Other ways that you can force execution is by using LD preload. And there's uh, several viruses 
that take advantage of this. And so once it, once it gets loaded, it passes it on to every child process. And if it gets into uh, the user session, then you know, it can do things against your account. There's also another variable called LD audit, which is a cleaner version of LD preload, but you know, the effect is the same, that you intercept uh, the, the runtime linker. I mean, with, with LD audit, you can do a lot more damage uh, because it allows you to intercept uh, all of the, the runtime linking and setting up, and you can redefine the functions. So you know, it's, a, it's a formidable tool to know about. An another way that things can execute is that uh, somebody can go change the ELF interpreter. Uh, in embedded inside these files uh, is the preferred interpreter. And usually it, it points to uh, ldlinux.so. Uh, uh, but it doesn't have to. You know, it's something you can define at, at compile time. So what you can do is you can have a legal uh, program, but the ELF interpreter's changed. And instead of doing runtime linking, a malicious interpreter just takes off and does malicious things. So it looks like you're executing one thing, but you're really executing something else. Another way that um, uh, programs execute is you know, through language interpreters, you know, such as Python, Perl, awk, other things like that. So that's, that's the traditional ways. Uh, but there's also um, much more malicious ways of executing code. And, and that's the mobile code. And when you execute through uh, mobile code, you know, we're talking about piping things into standard in uh, to be executed. You can, you can also pass programs you know, as command line arguments. Uh, I think you have up to 4,096 uh, characters uh, on the command line, which you know, that could be a small program that could bootstrap itself into you know, other, other things. Then there's um, uh, remote fetching, uh, like, like what Python does. Um, you can override and redefine the module import so that it pulls Python code across the network. And another thing that you can do with, with Python is that it can call arbitrary system calls. And so what you can do is you can open, uh, you know, with MFD create, uh, download something into that, and then execute, you know, based, and, and you know, it never touches disk. It's entirely in memory. Um, another thing is you can just paste the program straight into the shell. And here's an example, you know, of, of some of this, um, this mobile code. Um, this is, this is a function uh, that's written in bash. And this is functionally equivalent to the wget command, but it's entirely in bash. Because somewhere along the line, somebody decided it was a good idea to have bash to do TCP IP. It can also do just IP. Um, if, if you are a, an attacker, and you get to a shell, and you're in a container, and it's mounted read only, they're still going to get you. And the reason why is because of this. If they have access to bash, they can pull down anything. As a matter of fact, um, I, I can show you something here. Uh, we can, uh, this is a white hat talk, but we can do black hat for a little while. So. Here we got a bash shell. Um, let me see here. Disclose. And so here's the, the function that you can just paste right into the, the shell. And so if you're a bad guy, you, know, you, can, you can paste this right in. You, know, you get a shell, a reverse shell. And now you got, you got the function. Okay, so there's something there. Let's just, uh, let's just source it just to make sure. Now, I've already got something set up here. Um, so 
entirely using Bash. Right there, it can pull down a Python script. And if you go and just pipe that right into Python, and let's pull up another. And you can see right there on port 8080, we have a, a server. So this never touched a disk. This came off of the internet. There's, there's other things that you can do. Like, uh, for example, uh, here's another one. Um, with wget. WGET. Okay, so this just pulled another program off of the internet, and this is, this is the bad one. Uh, what, what this one does, it, it, this is a program called Snake Eater, and you can find this out on GitHub. Uh, what this does is it uh, creates an URL uh, to a shared object. Uh, next thing it does is it opens it right here, and, and it does that by uh, making an arbitrary system call, you know, to uh, create memfd or memfd create. So then, what it does is it reads it, and then down and then down here, it sets a path to this fd, and then it executes it. And so here's a you know a quick demonstration, again, of a, a program in Python that pulls down a shared object and executes it. So you can run arbitrary ELF code uh, using something like Snake Eater, and it never touches disk. Okay, so let's go back to White Hat. Okay, so you know this is just uh, some objectives that you know an attacker may may try to to do, um, but you know we can uh, narrow that down a little bit for this talk. And say that you know without privileges, what you can probably do is you know download malicious escalation tools. You can change search paths uh, for an account so that uh, it's it's trying to resolve things out of um, you know an attacker-controlled directory, uh, and you can ransomware the account uh, with privileges. Uh, you can modify and replace applications or libraries. You can install new applications. You know backdoors, rootkits, ransomware, crypto miners, everything. Or you can inject uh, malware into a running process uh, using ptrace. Okay, so w w with all this, you know, uh, let's we're going to start thinking about you know a solution to try and catch these things. Um, there is an API that the kernel has called File Access Notifications, and it's been available since uh, the, the 2.6.37 kernel. And it allows recursive monitoring within a mount point. It allows the, the user space application to say yes or no, uh, you know, on an access or execution. Um, and the kernel hands an open descriptor of the file to uh, the monitor program uh, so that it can read it. And this was originally designed uh, for uh, antivirus. Uh, it has a couple drawbacks uh, that you don't get any notifications on deletes or renames or file moves. And this is, um, uh, you know, just to show you uh, what, what you get when you uh, uh, do the FA, FA notify init, and then you set a mark, is eventually you get a callback, uh, and the, the data that comes to you is in this, this structure right here. So the two interesting things that, that uh, we're interested in is that you get an FD to the file, and it's open. Uh, so that you can ins inspect the file, but you also get the PID of the uh, the program that's trying to open the file. So from the the FD, we can we can gather some information about the file. Uh, we can take a look at what the file's full path is by uh, using read link against uh, you know proxelf FD. We can um, also take a look at uh, what the type of the file is. Uh, by passing the descriptor to libmagic. 
So you know, from, from this API, you can figure out this is a Perl program, this is Python, this is Ruby, this is PHP, this is ELF, um, and, or just a text file. We can uh, also figure out what device it's on uh, through um, the UDEV library. Uh, we can also um, figure out a trust status uh, by looking it up. You know, once we got the path, we can look it up in a database and see if this is something that we know about. And we can also uh, calculate a SHA-256 hash of it uh, using libgcrypt. We can also get some other information about the subject. Uh, the FD, obviously, you know, is information about the object. But we can get information about the subject by uh, looking at the PID. Uh, we can go into the proc, the proc file system and we can pull out what the, the uh, command name is. We can pull out the executable. Uh, we can figure out what uh, type it is by, by passing that into uh, libmagic. We can also figure out the UID, the, the uh, login UID, and the session ID, uh, and the proc file system also. So with these, these primitives and, and uh, you know, attributes, we can start to fashion a policy uh, you know, along these lines, uh, where we have a decision, some statements about the subject, and some statements about the object. And so you know, for the decision, we can tell it you know, if these things match to allow the access, or we can also tell it to do that with auditing, so that we get an audit event you know, saying that this is, this is allowed. We can also deny the access, and we can also create audit events based on uh, the denials if we want them. Um, the subject attributes uh, is just what we talked about a second ago in the, in the pictures. Um, you can tell it all, AUID, UID, session ID, PID, COM, um, and also some patterns. On the object side, you know, we, can, we can tell us, uh, you know, paths, directories, devices, file types, uh, and hashes. We can have multiple statements and, the, and they're anded together. Uh, this is a little bit of information about what is in these, these different things. Um, for the, the UIDs and session IDs, these are numbers. Uh, process ID is a number. Uh, com is a 15-character string. Uh, executables are also strings. Uh, the exec dir uh, also has some, some keywords that we can tell it uh, that, you know, it's executable dirs, which would be stuff like uh, sbin, uh, bin, uh, lib, and lib64, and libexec. Uh, system dirs would also include uh, etsy and maybe one or two other things. Now, we, we also can do pattern detection because the way the programs start up um, is different depending on what, what's happening. Um, I, I did have a pattern in here for LD preload, but then one day I was looking at it on a system that held LD library uh, for an NVIDIA graphics card, and so that causes the runtime linker to do completely different things. And um, I decided that it was unreliable at the moment. There's another way that we can, we can add this back in, but I, I pulled that one out for the moment. The object statements, uh, we can just tell it all. We can uh, have a path. Uh, we can tell it that, uh, that it has to be trusted or, un well, or untrusted, meaning that it lives in the, uh, the trust database. We can also tell it that uh, you know, a device like uh, dev at, uh, cd rom um, And one of the main uses, though, is for the file type, which you know, just because of libmagic uh, having things based around MIME types, um, we, we list things you know, in that format. So this is a, a sample policy you know, of what it looks like. And this is a uh, first match wins kind of um, uh, evaluation. So, so at the very top, we tell it that we don't want any execution you know, straight from the runtime linker. So we tell it, deny that with audit uh, and trigger on the pattern you know, of starting the program from the, the runtime linker. And that's for all objects. 
We also don't want to let untrusted executables run. And so we, we tell it we want to deny that with audit and that the, the execution DIRs have to be the, the exec DIRs that I mentioned before. And it has to be trusted. You know, if it's untrusted, then we're gonna deny. And that's against all objects. We also have a pattern here to allow all ELF applications. And this is, a, this is a pattern where you have to tell it to allow the types that you want, that's the whitelist, and then to deny everything else. And so we do the same thing with, with ELF libs, and that is we, we tell it what we want to allow to execute, and then we tell it deny everything else. Same thing with Python. We can, we can restrict it to the exact uh, directories, uh, you know, system directories, so that um, you know, it has to come from the system directory. But we also want it to be trusted. The, the design goals of this policy was to, to uh, have no bypass of the security by uh, starting a program from the runtime linker uh, and only approved executables that's in the trust database can, can run. ELF and Python files have to come from the system directories, and this prevents you know, LD library path and Python path uh, redirection. Uh, also, the other languages are, are disallowed by default. So if you have Perl on the system, you would want to go in and adjust the rules, or if you're using Ruby or PHP or anything like that. The design of, of this, uh, this application um, looks like this. We get the events uh, in a reader uh, thread, and the reason we do, do this um, is because the system will deadlock itself if, um, if this application tries to open anything. So what the reader thread does is it receives the event, looks at the PID, sees if it's the PID of the monitor program, FA policy D, and if it is, we go ahead and approve the, uh, the access, because you know why wouldn't we want to act, approve the accesses that we need? So if it's not that PID, it goes into an event queue and a decision thread gets it, and uh, this way, the reader thread can continue getting, getting events and putting them into the event queue. So the decision thread then needs to figure out, you know, what are we looking at? You know, what's the subject, what's the, uh, the object? And the thing is that um, it, it takes several system calls to, to figure out, you know, who's what. And so what you really want to do is to cache this information. And so, so the first thing it does is it tries to figure out uh, what are we looking at, and is this already you know, something we know about, and you know, is it in the cache? Because if it is in the cache, then we don't need to open up all these proc things. We can just go ahead and shortcut you know, to evaluating the rules you know, based on the cache. And so the cache is designed as a least recently used uh, cache so that it's self-cleaning. Things that are recently accessed uh, stay, stay at the top of the list, and things that uh, haven't been accessed for a while eventually get popped off of the uh, the cache. The decision thread also has a trust database. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, since, since I'm designing this on a Red Hat system, the trust database comes from RPM. So basically what the, the policy is, is saying that everything that we know about is packaged. The packaging information is trusted and we're gonna use that to make decisions. Oh, well, there's one other uh, feature in this, and that's a watchdog timer. Um, <clears throat> be because this is um, approving or denying access to things, I think it's, it's likely to be a, a, a target for attack. And so I've tried to design this in a way so that if somebody does try to get execution control, that there's a watchdog timeout that, that both of the threads have to acknowledge periodically uh, or the watchdog timeout's gonna, gonna kill the application. The program, you know, since it might be an attack target, you know, doesn't run as root, it retains capabilities. Uh, it also loads a set comp policy that prevents exec VE so that if somebody were uh, lucky enough to um, 
exploit this program, that the one thing they probably want, which is exec VE, is denied by the, by the policy. And then they're also going to have to deal with that watchdog timer. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, you know, sources of trust, uh, we can use a, a package database such as RPM. And out of that database, uh, there's the path, there's permissions, there's ownership, there's a SHA-256 uh, hash, and all of the entries are signed. So you know, every, every package uh, can be trusted in the database. There's another source of, of information that's, uh, that's new and on the horizon. And this is called SWID, which uh, is an acronym for Software Identification. This is covered by an ISO standard, and NIST is also putting this, uh, they've also got a, uh, an information uh, reference, uh, 8060, which uh, details uh, their take on the ISO standard, and you know, they, they put their electives into it. A SWID is also being driven into all of the common criteria um, protection profiles, one by one, they're asking for manufacturers to include SWID information for uh, all the software they're shipping. So today, it's kind of sparse, and you might not find many SWID tags, but over time, it's, it's going to be uh, everywhere. Now, to talk a little bit more about SWID tags, uh, because this is really a, an up-and-coming standard, uh, there's four kinds of tags. Uh, one is called the, the corpus tag. And what the corpus tag is, is it's like uh, for a body of software, like a, like a CD-ROM. So a CD-ROM would have a SWID tag in, in a specified directory, and it would give the information about uh, what's, what's on the CD-ROM. There's a primary tag, which uh, allows you to describe the product. There's a patch tag, but this is really aimed more at the Microsoft world, where you install something, and then you, you have Patch Tuesday, and you, you keep updating. And so this is designed you know, more for the Microsoft world. And then there's supplemental tags, which allow you to add information like um, linking to web pages you know, for, for more information. Uh, the SWID tags are an XML uh, file. Uh, they, they convey information about uh, the publisher licensing. Um, and then there's an optional payload section, which details uh, files, sizes, and hashes. And, and this can also be extended with um, information about permission and ownership. And then the whole thing is uh, digitally signed using the x80s uh, specification. On Fedora and in RHEL, you can find SWID tags in user lib SWID tag. And here's an example of what, what they look like. Um, there's much more to this um, because this doesn't have the optional uh, payload section, which is the, the part that, that's probably most interesting. Okay, so let's take a quick look uh, and do another live demo here. Okay, so um, it's coming up right now. It's uh, running, uh, it loaded its rules, it changed the, the UID initialized the database, uh, did an integrity check of the database, and it found a miscompare, so right now it's rebuilding, rebuilding its database. Now, one thing to mention is that uh, what it's doing right now is that we, we use L LDBM as the, the database, and the reason why is because it's way faster than, than the RPM database. So what we do is we create our own, our own database out of the RPM database, and that way we don't have to worry about locking and other applications. Normally it works a lot faster than this, but this is an old laptop. And I was having trouble getting the, uh, 
the PDF file to open, so there's something, something busy on this machine. Taking way too long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm wondering if RBM had had something locked. Okay, now, now we got this thing up and running. So um, this is the debug mode, uh, which is uh, not the way you would normally run it, but this is a lot more informational, uh, so you can see what it's, what it's doing. Uh, what it's telling you is the, the rule that it triggered on, uh, what the decision was, uh, and then some, some information to help debug with, which is what executable and what file uh, it, it's trying to, to be accessed. Okay, so let's uh, let's follow this uh, this demo script here. I've, I've got let's go over here to temp, and you can see when I when I ran CD that it created a whole lot of access. So what we want to do is copy the system ls into the temp directory, and let's also make a symlink. Try to run this program. And over here you can see the, the, the denials. Okay, so let's try it from a symlink. And you see it, it was allowed. And the reason why is because it resolved it uh, to the uh, system uh, LS program way back here. So the symlink, uh, you, you didn't get the full path. You get what, what the, real, the real object was. OK, so let's try to run this program from the runtime linker. And so we got a, a denial. OK. And just in case. Oh, well, we've already got a copy of it there. Let's try to, let's try to run that one because just to show you that uh, the temp directory uh, is loaded with a um, uh, permission so it doesn't allow execution. So you see here it, it denies it, you know, even from the home directory and you can see that the denial is over, well, way past down. Okay, so back to the demo. Let's take a look at a program that uh, has the, the interpreter changed. And just to show you that the, the interpreter is changed, we'll take a look at it with read elf. Oh, that's right. Where is test? Oh, there it is, yeah. I think it was denied. Yeah, there was a denial. Well, let's try to run it. Actually, I'll, I'll show you this file in just a second. Uh, let's, let's run it. So there was a, a denial. And the one last. Okay, let's go. Let's go try and run that system. Oh, 
Okay, denied. And you can see that uh, system, system Python files are allowed to run. And one of the things I have it to do in debug mode is to output some, some statistics so that you can see how, how it's performing. Uh, in this case, uh, there is about 1,200 accesses allowed and 11 of them denied. Uh, the cache size is uh, 1024, uh, 43 slots were in use. We had a lot of hits. Uh, same thing on the, the object side. Oh, while well, we're here. Now that that's shut down, you can see right here in the ELF that it's, it's uh, not requesting the normal runtime linker but a, but a fake interpreter. Okay, so I did show you the, uh, the statistics report, but it also leaves a breadcrumb trail. Over in uh, var log, uh, there's a FA policy D uh, file that's dropped there when the program shuts down. So that just in case you need it for forensics information, uh, there's a breadcrumb trail of everything the system was doing right before it shut down. Uh, but that's also configurable because there may be cases when you don't want that information sitting on the disk drive. Okay, so looking back at our original uh, code coverage, um, we can deny everything that's got a line through it. Uh, the things that are in red are, are within reach. Those, those I can cover with just a little bit more work. Um, and then also this fetched remotely thing. Uh, this is being handled an entirely different way. Um, I've, I've been talking to people in the Python community and explaining the dangers of, of Python and uh, mobile code and things like that. So what they've uh, done is um, there's a, a PEP 578 uh, that's been approved and is being worked on for Python 3.8. And what it will do is it will add audit hooks to uh, the Python interpreter. And uh, then also you can have a, uh, a monitor that looks at these hooks and decides yes or no. And this will be inside the same binary. And so we will be able to have a policy inside the Python interpreter that says no code from standard in. Uh, you're not allowed to override the um, module resolution. You can't pull things from the net. You can't have programs that come from the command line. So uh, this, this should be in 3.8, and it will solve the problem there, but I don't, we, you got the same problem in other languages, but I don't have uh, leverage or ways of influence communities for the other interpreters. Uh, some things I really wish uh, would make life a little easier is that you know if we get notification on exit, you know I suppose there's a way to do it, but you know it wouldn't be serialized with the the main event queue, and that causes some problems. Um, the other thing is if um, you know because we have to figure out is this thing in the cache, you know what are we looking at? The very first thing we need to do is get some some stat information. So if that was passed uh, with the event, then uh, that would save one system call, and we can make a decision a lot faster. And then the other thing is in the proc file system, everything is in different files. It would be awesome if some, some of this information was uh, collated. Uh, like for example, proc self status does not have the login UID. You have to go open proc self login UID to find that. So you know, it would be good if some of this was uh, consolidated so there's just like one open system call and then a read and then we can make a decision. Um, things that are in the near term, near term is uh, reinstating the LD audit, LD preload uh, coverage, uh, detecting statically linked applications, uh, interpreters pulling code from standard in, even though this will be solved by PEP 578, there's still old systems out there that need protecting. Uh, and you know, detecting code from standard in, from the command line, st uh, standalone shell usage, and uh, adding more threads to it so it can scale out. So how this might fit, uh, I'll briefly go through this. Um, 
the audit system has a bunch of event feeds. Uh, from the kernel, we can get promiscuous socket, core dump, sim links, net filter, TTY, uh, syscall, and file watches. There's also trusted programs that send events, uh, such as PAM login, uh, shadow utils, password, SE manage, uh, cups, clevas, uh, LibreSwan. And there's also policy engines. You know, LSMs and setcomp uh, can also set cause events. And then there's integrity apps, AID, FA policy D, USB guard. So we can take these events and start to fashion a system together where uh, events uh, wind up coming to the audit daemon. You know, right here it just shows the, the application whitelisting daemon. And then the audit daemon can have an IDS plugin, uh, you know, to, to look at things. Uh, the audit system is really easy to use. Uh, you don't have to worry about parsing events. There's an audit parsing library, which uh, takes care of all the idiosyncrasies of, of the audit system and just makes some, some calls and it gives you the data in nice little chunks. And then, you know, what, what we would look at is putting this into an IDS system with an ensemble model, uh, some, something like this, that looks for bad events. It does pattern analysis, uh, does burst analysis, uh, looks at historical norms, norms, and does misuse detection. And then, you know, that all gets summed up, and then there's a reaction to it. And uh, that concludes the presentation. Uh, questions? So is there a revocation story for the trusted database? Yes, any time that the database is updated, <clears throat> we get, inf we get uh, signaled and we update the database. So if, for example, you do RPM-E you know, to erase a, 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 a package, then that would trigger an update to the database and then we would know that, that that's no longer there. So that's, that's kind of how revocation would, would work. And the IDS model that you talked at the end about is more of a blacklisting model. I, I'm afraid I didn't understand the question. Please. So the, the last thing that you talked about is not whitelisting. You said you are looking for patterns, blacklisting basically patterns. Yes, yes, it's doing more than whitelisting. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right because whitelisting is just about the provenance and, and whether or not it's in the trust database. But uh, in, a, in, a, in a way you can stretch that to say that uh, the runtime linker uh, is what we trust, you know, and if they're calling a different runtime linker, then it's outside, you know, what's trusted. Um, you mentioned um, Switek. In case you're not a big fan of XML, just want to let you know there's an IETF draft for doing Switek and concise binary called CoSwig, just in case you're not yes. an XML fan. Yeah. XML fan. Also, I just want to do a forward reference. We in, at our three o'clock presentation are defining another type of SWID tag for our firmware. So just kind of a unabashed um, forward reference. Yes. So how does this work uh, in, along with other access control um, systems like IMA or SCLNX? Uh, it, how does it coexist with other ecosystems? Well, this, because we're in the file access uh, path, I think that we're before the DAC permissions. And SE Linux is after the DAC permissions. So I, I suppose in a way we get first vote, or th this program gets first vote, or something like that. But it coexists uh, fine. They're complementary. Uh, so is UEFI Secure Boot. This doesn't try to solve that problem. And so it's complementary on top of that because really what this is, is aimed at is solving the problem of, you know, if somebody pops in a shell, you know, from a daemon or uh, gets access to somebody, somebody's system through their credentials, and that's way after boot. But that's really what this is designed for. Uh, so, okay, last question. So, uh, two questions, since you said last question, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, do you have any plans to extend this to uh, kernel module whitelisting? Would, would we extend this to be a kernel module? Uh, no, uh, to whitelist kernel modules. 
Oh, the whitelist kernel mods. Yeah, um, I, I believe we can do that. I, you know, I, I would just have to double check to see if um, the FA notify system uh, gets notified. And, and if it does, then yes, we can. Okay. Uh, the second question is, okay, uh, believe uh, the trusted database or the trust model is, uh, works efficiently when the software or the applications are installed from the package manager. And uh, uh, if you have uh, legitimate scenarios where you are not using a package manager or you are not installing packages, rather you are uh, directly dropping the applications, distributing by a different uh, distribution mechanism, and you have a, uh, a legitimate need to allow only certain binaries which are uh, distributed by a different distribution system, how, how do you uh, uh, foresee this fitting? Okay. Um I, I'm not entirely sure I understood all the question, but what I believe I heard was if somebody uh, has applications that's not packaged and you install it and you want that to be trusted, how do you handle that situation? And if that's the case, uh, there's an admin defined list that you can also modify, which would then grant trust you know, to that. So it's, it's, there is a way you know, to add your own whitelist to this so that you don't have to depend entirely on the packager. So uh, we're out of time for the questions, but I'm sure Steve will be around uh, later. Thank you. Yes, Steve. thanks.